have talked about the boy we love. So this is a case uh, we saw from the Red Cross, a four-year-old boy who was previously well, HIV unexposed, his rapid analyzing tests were both negative, all immunizations were to date, um, lives in Atlanta, so his family and uh, any reason travel history and reported dogs at home. So his initial presentation was in March last year with suspected meningitis based on symptoms of headache, vomiting, and some reported fever. So they did some initial bloods, which was fairly unremarkable. White cell count was 27, CRP was one, blood cells was negative. And the LP was quite abnormal. You can see the raised protein, glucose is a bit low, and poly predominant. But nothing on the gram saying culture didn't grow anything. The other investigations were normal. So he was then treated with ketraxone. I'm not sure exactly how long he got it because this was at a peripheral hospital. But after some time, I'm guessing 10 to 14 days, it was better and then was discharged. Five months later, he readmitted to the same center with the exact same symptoms. So same thing was done, bloods, still pretty unremarkable, CRP was only one. Had a CSF done, uh, LP done again, which was abnormal as well. Protein was high, poly predominant, and this time he had a PCR meningitis panel that showed listeria monocytogenes. So the decision was then made to treat him for 21 days with IV and ambicillin, and after that he was better and then was discharged. That was his second admission. Four months later, he presented to Red Cross with similar symptoms again, but according to the mom, it was increased in severity. Initial bloods were done, the normal again, as you can see, CRP was only three. So then they decided to do some imaging. They did a CT brain, which showed acute hierocephalus, but no other abnormalities seen. Then they decided, okay, he needs a VP shunt, and then they put in a VP shunt and took some CSF. Excuse me. And the CSF was quite unremarkable, only two you know, for sites, but the PCR men came back as group B strep, which was the second infection on a uh, diagnosed on the PCR men. So, as I said, the VP shunt was inserted, he was started on, on antibiotics and he was treated for 10 to 14 days, got better. He was discharged to follow up with neurosurgery, and then he was also referred to infectious diseases for a primary immune deficiency work. It was the same. Fast forward four months, he still got his VP shunt in, and his mom brought him in with worsening headaches again. And the initial assessment was either due to a blocked VP shunt or possible VP shunt infection. So Bloods once again completely normal. Uh, they took some CSF from that VP shunt in the ward, and it was quite cellular, but once again, nothing seen on the gram stain or the culture. Then they decided, okay, let's take out the VP shunt, it's probably infected, and then they sent it to the lab. And on culture, we grew two different coagulase negative steps. He was then treated with vancomycin for a period of time and then was discharged home with the shunt. So this is just the kind of a summary of all the LPs that he did that he had over the course of a year of significance, those two little ones that he had a PCR meant for hysteria and for group B strip, which is quite uncommon in his age group. So then one week later, after being discharged from this VP shunt infection and vancomycin treatment, unsurprisingly represented acutely ill with clinical signs of hydrocephalus. They did a CT brain again, which showed hydrocephalus, no other abnormality seen. And so he was booked for an emergency EVD for acute relief of hydrocephalus. So when they took him to theater, uh, they used endoscopy to do the EVD, and they saw this in his natural ventricle. So all these round little cystic bubbles floating around in ventricle, and they decided to take some of them out and uh, the ones that they could access, and then booked an MRI for him post op and left the EVD in. So this is the MRI scan. So I'm gonna see if I can just point out it's fairly obvious. So if you look here, the lateral ventricle is quite densely packed with all these big cells here going all the way down to the fourth ventricle into the subarachnoid space. 
So based on this imaging and what they found intraoperatively, they said this is the mnemonic of race most neurosystem psychosis. So race most neurosystem psychosis is an extra parenchymal form, much less common than parenchymal form. And it's usually caused by aberrant proliferation of these cesto membranes. Um, and it's due to the segmentation of parenchymal sister circuit. And as the scoliosis degrade, they form newer and newer system membranes. So that's this mostly abnormal growth of the cystic membranes, and they usually do not viable. We usually don't have any scoliosis in it's just the cystic membranes. So you then some of those cysts got sent for histology, which confirmed it was a multi-loculated parasitic membranes. Lots of these cinephiles didn't see any scoliosis, but they did see these sheepness mouth parts or booklets, which we found was quite odd. So we then chatted to Prof Freen at the NICD for some advice. And he asked us to send him the histology slides so he can also have a look at it. Then he promptly responded with his answers and he, he saw a scoliosis there. So this is a scolex. You can see the two suckers on the sides, and this is the mouth part. This is usually where the clits are. And on this side, you can see these spiral canals, which is kind of part of the body of the larva, the immature uh, larvae. Also, saw some clits. So, this is just a zoom in picture of that part. But this is a sucker here, it's another sucker on that side, and then here's the mouth part, so the clits. So he thought that this was quite strange because we believe that it's usually only membranes, but based on the morphology of this, he thought it was most likely still going to be tinea solium or neurosystosicosis, but asked us to send a PCR on the fluids so they could do a pancesto PCR and just see what's going on. So came back positive, unsurprisingly, but then they sent a uh, PCR products for sequencing, and then the parasite was identified as Tinea cerealis, which then changed our diagnosis from neurosystosicosis to co-neurosis. So co-neurosis is less known, and it's a parasitic disease that's caused by these larval stages of the co forming Tinea species. So that's Tinea multiceps cerealis, Bronia, and glomerata. And it's primarily a disease that you see in animal sheep and other ungulates, but it can in rare instances affect humans as well as a dead end accidental intermediate host. So kind of historically, it's been described for a long time and some of the texts of Hippocrates describe this weird neurological disorder that they saw in sheep that was almost epilepsy-like and it later led to its name as gift or stagger because the sheep would start walking around in circles and have a very unsturdy gait. But it was only until the early 19th century in the diagnosis the first human case of co-neurosis. And at that time, it was thought to be caused by the tapeworm tinea multiceps. So looking at co-neurosis, as I said, the disease in humans is very rare. And there's been some sporadic, sporadic reports only about a hundred of them worldwide. And of these, the vast majority of them is due to tinea multiceps. But the first documented case of human co-neurosis that's caused this species, tinea cerealis, was back in 1933, and it was a 59-year-old French lady who had a subcutaneous cyst that they extracted and fed the cyst contents to a dog who then developed the adult tapeworm, and then they could identify as tinea cerealis based on the characteristics of the scolex. So geographically, it's, fine. it's found pretty widespread, although most of the human cases are from Africa, but it also sporadic cases uh, do appear in some of the sheep raising areas of Europe and Americas. But in Africa, T. bronia and Clomerata are the only, or they only occur in Africa. Looking at the life cycle, it's pretty similar to Tinea soilium in that there's a definitive host, which is kind of a carnivore, which hosts the mature parasite or the mature tapeworm, um, which will then excrete the proglottids 
that contain the unembryonated eggs, which then embryonate in the environment, and they get taken up by uh, herbivores, um, which then will develop the cysts. And then when they are eaten again by the carnivore, they complete the life cycle. So the Tinea cerealis is usually dogs and foxes, and the intermediate host is a rabbit. So unlike uh, Tinea solium, humans, so in Tinea solium, a human can take both definitive and intermediate host shapes and can kind of have both pathogenesis. But in coenurosis, we can only be the intermediate host, and the egg is obviously the infective stage. So this is just a look at the parasite. The egg, very much like all the other tinea eggs, are microscopically indistinguishable. The adults are quite long, up to a meter long, and lots of proglottids. And then there's globular scolex, which is the head, with a double crown of large and small nucleus. In the intermediate host, this is where the co or the cyst forms, and this is this globular ovoid white fluid filled cyst that's got a very thin transparent collapsing wall and a delicate inner germinal membrane and from this germinal membrane it contains all these small protoscolices and unlike what you see in hydatid disease or gynecococcus cysts they don't have broad capsules or any daughter cysts so when it comes to human disease, as I said earlier, we do not support maturation of these cysts. We can't be definitive hosts. We can only form intermediate hosts and get tissue infections with the in your eye. And we usually become infected, obviously, by ingestion of the eggs that's present from the definitive host. In most documented cases, there's been a prolonged exposure to dogs or sheep. And what happens is when we ingest the eggs, these oncospheres hatch from the eggs. They've got small little hooklets that then penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate through the bloodstream to their preferred tissue, which is usually uh, the CNS, the brain, eyes, or muscle tissue, and it takes about three months for them to develop into the cyst. So there's different, different kind of clinical manifestations, the most common being subcutaneous nodules. So they can form on any part of the body and they may, might be quite fluctuant and tender, and in Africa, it's described to more commonly involve the, the intercostal areas on the anterior abdominal wall. And you can imagine the differential diagnosis can include many things like lipoma, neurofibromyoma. And the way to establish the diagnosis is usually by surgical removal and then looking at the of pathology. So there's no serological test. Then the other form of the disease is ocular and CNS. So in the CNS, it can either affect the parenchyma or the intraventricular system. And it can cause arachnoiditis, ependymitis, can affect the spinal cord or the eyes, as I said, they've all been described. And the clinical manifestations, as you can imagine, can vary as a whole spectrum of neurological symptoms from seizures, which is usually the most common, to focal neurological deficits, or if it's in, located in the ventricles or subarachnoid space may lead to raised intracranial pressure. The majority of the global CNS co cases is usually in the adult population. And then in sheep, as I mentioned earlier, it causes this thing called fatal blind staggers or co cerebralis, where they are very stagger-like, unstable on their feet, and they eventually pass away. So just the spectrum of CNS co as a whole Tinea multiceps is the most common one, and that's the one that's been best described, and they can cause both parenchymal and CSF pathway disease, which closely resembles the kind of disease that tinea solium also causes. So in the parenchyma, usually the cyst is surrounded by a thick layer of mononucleated cells, or when it's situated in the CSF pathways, it induces an arachnoiditis or diffuse ependymitis, and then can cause obstruction and hydrocephalus. So there's only been about 40 cases of human CNS coenurosis reported. And until recently, all of these cases, the assumed etiological agent was confined to multi, uh, tinea multisip. So you can see there's all the species, except the very last of these ones here. 
tinea cerealis, tinea cerealis for these two. So in 2020, in Japan, they reported the first case of human co-neurosis caused by tinea cerealis. This guy had a single parenchymal lesion in the occipital lobe, which they surgically excised, and then by gene sequencing, they could confirm the ID to be tinea cerealis. And then last year in South Africa, there was a five-year-old boy who presented pretty similarly to our case, and he, but he had disseminated subarachnoid co-neurosis, and also with gene sequencing, they could ID it as tinea cerealis. And that was the first case of disseminated subarachnoid tinea cerealis seen. So based on these two reported cases, it's speculated that tinea cerealis infection can produce the same two basic pathological forms that neurocystisicosis have. So either parenchymal disease or uh, exoparenchymal disease that resembles race pose, race pose form. So clinically very, very difficult to, to differentiate between the two and radiologically as well. So both etiological agents results insist that on MRI appear dark and on uh, T2 where the images can be bright and may have room-like enhancement in some cases, but because they often are still viable, they don't really have calcification. So it's a very thin wall, which you often miss. But the one clue that can help you, uh, that can support the, the, the diagnosis of in neurosis rather than neurosis psychosis, is if you can see multiple eccentric nodules in the system, uh, compared to in neurocystisicosis, is usually only isolated nodules. That can give you a hint. And histologically, so in the past, traditionally, diagnosis was really based on this kind of inaccurate morphological criteria that they used, where they looked at the scolices and the shape and the number of the hooklets to determine what the species are. So this is what tinea cerealis looks like. This is those spiral canals that we saw on our previous slides. And this is the arm scolex with the hooklets here. And on this one, you can see the two suckers like we saw as well. And then this is the mark part of the hooklets in the center there. But luckily with the advance of uh, molecular diagnostic techniques, we can now more accurately identify the species. So, because there's such limited treatment on CNR CNS co-neurosis infection, we have to extrapolate a lot of the protocols for neurocystisicosis to provide us the best evidence. And it's kind of this three-pronged approach between anti-elementic drugs, corticosteroids, and surgical management. And really the choice of how you treat it depends on the clinical manifestation, depends on the location, the number, the size, and the stage of the neurocystis the soci. And there's also some controversy that exists as to whether the therapy actually modifies the natural history of the cysts. Plus, there's also concerns regarding treatment that could actually exacerbate the disease because as you treat the viable cyst, they release all these antigens causing quite a bit of inflammatory reaction. But generally, your anti thick drugs of course will either be albendazole or prosopontal. So in parenchymal disease, um, there's been some comparative clinical trials, and it seems that albendazole was equivalent or superior to prosequantil in reducing the number of lives as the surgery, and overall had a better reduction in long-term seizure activity, and usually the duration is around 15 days. But for extra parenchymal disease, so subarachnoid or intraventricular, it's a little bit more tricky because there's no randomized controlled trial data that we can rely on. But we know that albendazole is more likely to be effective because it's superior in penetrating the blood brain barrier, as well as, as the fact that serum and CSF metabolite levels appear to be potentiated by the concomitant use of corticosteroids, where it's the opposite that happens with prosequantum. And the duration of therapy is also not really well defined, usually much more prolonged than parenchymal disease but it is individualized and they're based on clinical and radiologic response. Despite this, like, people often use a combination approach with albendazole and prosequantil, um, and it's been shown to be effective in destroying viral cysts without increasing treatment-associated side effects. 
and so in severe disease, they often um, prescribe these two together. So when it comes to corticosteroids, the only real good data that we have for adjunctive corticosteroids when uh, isolated cases of people with single parenchymal lesions, and it was found to decrease the local inflammatory actions and a better long-term outcomes. But based on what we know of the inflammatory response that we see in neurosystosis and the benefit of the above, expert opinion is does recommend the use of corticosteroids usually begun prior to the antiparasitic drugs because it will reduce the inflammatory response to those dying cystic foci. Um, and usually these dying subarachnoid cystic foci might worsen the obstructive hydrocephalus as well. Then surgical management, when it comes to interventricular cysts, they advise that they should be removed as far as possible, preferably visually by endoscopy. But it's quite rare that you can remove all the cysts because they're frequently multiple and they are often adhering to the cranial nerves, to the brain stem, and vasculature due to the arachnoiditis that they cause. So these procedures often have a high morbidity and mortality if you try and remove four of them. And external CSF diversion, usually a VP shunt or um, EVD, is usually necessary, especially if there's already raised intracranial pressure present. Despite initial adequate control of hydrocephalus, the percentage of shunt complications is still very high, with up to 80% of people requiring shunt revisions in the short term. And exoparenchymal co-neurosis continues to have a very high mortality rate. So what happened to our patient? So they took him back to theater and they tried to remove as many of the cysts as they could. They reinserted a VP shunt. He was started on corticosteroids initially, and then albendazole and prasiquantel was added. He had a recent follow-up, I think a month or two ago, and he's doing really well. And he's awaiting repeat imaging, I think later this month, that will still guide how long treatment's gonna be, but he's still on albendazole and prasiquantel, as well as the anti agent. So that makes him the only documented survivor or surviving place with the serialis extra parenchymal disease. So the two kind of elements that baffled us a bit about this case was why did he have a positive PCR means? And the most likely uh, explanation for this is probably because it was false positives due to inappropriate binding of primers. And another less possible reason could be that there was translocation of the actual gut bacteria, but because we know it takes so long to grow these things, it's pretty unlikely for that to happen. But unfortunately, most of the PCR experts are at the conference, so they can't uh, weigh in. And the second question that I also had is why did he improve after his first two admissions with antibiotics? So first of all, I'm not really sure if he got steroids during those, those admissions because it was at peripheral hospitals. But I think it's probably because he had multiple LPs and that probably raised the intracranial pressure and relieved the symptoms, which led to improving. 